0.2. It's not a build number, it's not a statistic, it's not a fee. It's the user score for Madden 21 on Metacritic. Things aren't much better for FIFA, nor NHL, and 2K's NBA releases aren't regarded much higher, not even WWE. Many would question the authenticity of these user scores, but even among critics, there's never been a lower point in the history of mainstream sports games. There are those who've returned from cryosleep, though the lack of advancement in these franchises from their sixth generation counterparts, let alone their seventh or eighth, is off-putting to many. When it comes to global sports viewed in their millions, there's three licenses that are looked favorably upon in gaming. Sony's MLB The Show, Konami's Pez Soccer, and Codemasters Formula One. 12 years, 14 games, and millions of copies later, the games and the sport in which they're based have grown in all avenues. Where EA and 2K's releases are characterized by a lack of content, notable improvements, or integrity of any sort, Cody's find themselves topping the sales and critical charts with all of those. Other games might be more realistic, polished, or flexible, but few juggle challenge, accessibility, and immersion, as well as the F1 franchise has. It's why, then, there's monumental doubt surrounding the company's future, as Codemasters have been acquired by Electronic Arts. Slightly Mad's Project Cars, Dirt, Grid, and most notably F1, for the first time since 2003, will have an EA Sports logo on the box. Considering what's known, it's worrying that the world's premier motorsports heading down a path just as treacherous as football or hockey. Originally, when writing this video, it was within the context of F1 in the real world entering a new era. But with the next generation of its cars having been pushed to 2022, this video is now about the end of an era for its gaming developer. Beginning at my beginning, Formula One 2019 is a superb game that captures the unique intensity, quality, and spectacle of the sport. To build a proper car PG where the player decides where to start in a sandbox that's dynamic enough to engage players for multiple seasons. Not to quote myself. I didn't put the game down after that initial video. I played for another 80 hours, furthering the career mode a bit, but mostly participating in full-length races against friends in a top 3 fight. But I'm talking about this game first to set the stage for what's to come. So why is F1 2019 such a great game? For one thing, it looks fantastic, in all conditions, whether it's the sun setting over the French horizon, pouring rain in Britain, or saturated skies of Montreal, everything from the textures, lighting, and even the buttons and heads-up display on the steering wheel is meticulously detailed and strikingly authentic. There's a lot of driving games that look and sound great, but it's made all the more impressive that Gran Turismo Sport credits a thousand people, where F1 2019's staff is half that size. Codemasters are punching well above their weight in presentation, especially in what is also one of the most feature-rich Formula 1 games ever developed. If Formula 1's so good, where's Formula 2? Right here. With all of the Junior League's teams, drivers, and rules. The slower speeds and equally built machines are a trade-off for vehicles that are more punishing to handle than their Formula 1 counterparts. There's also the generations of classic cars that can be played on and offline, and a dedicated multiplayer car with its own characteristics and custom liveries players can take to dedicated leagues set up by friends or greater organizations. But for players uninterested in multiplayer, there is more than enough to keep them hooked with one of the most expansive and acclaimed career modes of any sports title featuring a massive R&D tree to improve your vehicle with credits earned via objectives achieved in practice sessions. New seasons bring on rule changes, potentially ravishing a team's investments come after New Year's. You need to keep teams happy via timed interviews, completing objectives, and not screwing up. There's parts to manage at risk of earning penalties, driver changes combining with vehicle progression, pushing and pulling teams up and down the grid personalizing your experience to make the career mode uniquely yours. 
All of this within a game engine whose handling model felt excellent on the G29 Danny O'Dwyer generously lent to me and the direct drive I've got now, while still being accessible to people who call him Gross Gene. The sense of speed, weight, and grip makes wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles brilliant fun, especially in career against the harder AI. Having to manage your parts, fuel, and energy system, all the while trying to stay ahead of a car which may statistically be ahead of yours. So, gorgeous graphics, slick presentation, deep but accessible gameplay, plentiful content, and an in-depth career mode. These things would come to define Codemasters Formula One games, but while I've got a particular fondness for it, Ah, you I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, <laughs> 2019 is not the best. That'll come later, along with the worst and the weirdest. But one thing's for certain, it didn't start like this. Codemasters' first release was an outsourced PSP and Nintendo Wii exclusive by OutRun 2 developer Sumo Digital, and I think they might have carried over their fondness for drifting. There's absolutely no sensation the tires are actually touching the road surface, irrespective of compound conditions or car. And considering the game released for PSP, it wasn't a bizarre method of optimizing motion controls. It's like there's an auto-centering effect while steering, where turning the wheel right makes a comeback left for a split second before finally setting into a straight line. What's most bizarre about this arcade handling, however, is that it doesn't make you drive any faster than a sim. There's still harsh braking zones, narrow roads, vehicle damage, and penalties. Trying to drive cleanly in this game is like swinging a lubricated bat. You have the power to keep it in your hands, just not by much. Despite the cars being from 2009, they're more like the cars from 1969, only drivers had a lot more respect for each other. The AI has no consideration for holding lines, braking at a reasonable distance, or moving past a disqualified driver, though I didn't respect them much in return. Uh, yes. I mean, you in theory, you can't, you can't oh keep God. that shit. You can get used to the controls. There's some enjoyment to be had in nailing high-speed corners, and there's a decent feature list including a challenge mode that's not unlike the career events in modern games with overtaking and checkpoint races. What this game lacks is detail, not just in its technical graphics from being a Wii game, but the poor AI, inaccurate, inconsistent track design, and hysterically harsh rules. Send the is coming up, we can see if we can cut the corner. Coward. For what? For what? Damage wings don't notably affect performance. Slipstream's more like warp drive. Compounds are virtually indistinguishable. Red Bull's B team can outpace Red Bull. And drive through penalties are given on the final lap, which can't be served. There's an average arcade racer here, but with not one quality to distinguish it from the competition. We might have other bad games to cover soon, but this is easily the worst. Had I started with it, there's no way I would have imagined buying an installment one decade later. I could have started with this game. Season 1 of Drive to Survive was my reintroduction to the sport before watching actual races and scouring the internet for more in-depth and accurate reporting. All of that was about the 2018 season. There were months to go before Codemasters' next Formula 1 game to release. It was even dirt cheap on sale. But I didn't purchase it because 2019 seemed like it'd carry all of this game's strength with the presentation to make it truly shine, and playing it now, that's exactly what it is. F1 2019 Beta Judged on its own, this game is great with its career mode sealing the structure for years to come with nearly everything mentioned in 2019 interviews, rule changes, ERS management, etc. Whether you're battling the AI or friends, in the dry or wet, on pad or wheel, 2018 engages. But while playing, I couldn't help but think I was glad I waited, because this is the game compared to its sequel. Same track, same time, same car. And then there's the sound design. I might prefer V10s and V8s like everyone else, but 2019's the first game to give these engines the detail, clarity, and character akin to real life. This? No. Formula 1 2018 marked the end for Codemasters' old presentation. 
the screenshot menus, dial-up music. No, seriously, the main menu has dial-up sounds. The flat lighting and even flatter sound effects all end here. And while the game itself is still solid, it doesn't leave a notable mark on the franchise today. There's no unique circuits, rules, features, or most notably, style. Unlike... Formula 1 2010 was the serious debut. Coming hot off the heels of Grid and Dirt 2, Codemasters released their first HD Formula 1 title, only one of two in the whole industry at the time. Previous rights holders Sony released Formula 1 Championship Edition for PS3, replicating the 2006 season. The last three seasons were never depicted officially. There was lots of pressure internally, and not just stemming from fan expectation. The team they had working on those early games was remarkably small. Even in terms of like Codemasters as different subsets, it was the smallest of the bunch by a mile. The F1 team was in a different building even, by the way. Just like 2019, F1's staff was half compared to 2009's Dirt 2, tasking even fewer developers than the original grid from 2008. Yet the presentation hadn't diminished. I'm not appreciating the visuals because of what I've just played. I'm appreciating the soundtrack, energetic camera angles, slick menus and transitions, personality, something that's often lacking in racing games, especially in Formula One. Codemasters weren't content with just copying broadcasts. Main menus take place within the paddock, yet are somehow faster than its sequels. Options are placed within the garage, computer screens are controlled from your vehicle, and original music cues are baked into the transitions and openings. Perhaps it's coming from hundreds of hours spent in cold, calculated, but clear menus. I really appreciate this effort to immerse players within the world itself. It is Codemaster's own creative stamp on the sport, and all the good and bad that comes from that. The good? It plays very well, even today. On a modern machine, it runs like a dream, but more than that, the weight of vehicles, management of engine temperature and tire wear, finding lines in the wet, and pure challenge of driving these machines is bang on. Adjusting the angle at Malaysia, catching a terrifying slide at Monaco, or keeping your pedal to the floor in Turkey's Turn 8 feels great as does battling the AI through hectic first sectors, or catching them via superior strategy, and not for wins, but positions. That's Formula One's appeal in gaming. What it lacks in vehicle and track selection, it more than makes up for in on-track action. Whether it's for the first podium or first point, you'll be battling wheel-to-wheel -wheel for every position, at least when the game's functioning as intended. We'll come to that later. Despite sharing the hideous color palette, F1 2010 doesn't really feel like grit at all. Nearly every Codemasters racing game is a simcade. That's to say, you race on tracks set in the real world with braking zones, throttle management, and mechanical damage, but the physics performance and vehicle behaviors aren't built as a simulation of a real car. Simcade isn't binary, it's a spectrum. Grid's cars accelerate at a blistering pace, brake even faster, and have a preference for power slides. F1 isn't like this at all. The acceleration and braking's fast because of the cars, but braking zones need to be practiced. Spinning the rear is easy even on half traction control, and scrubbing off speed via bumps or an unstable car seriously costs you in pace. It's a lot more serious than grid, demanding concentration and consistency. It's infuriating when you're stuck with a bad setup on a circuit you hate settling for 19th, but it's exhilarating on a track you love exceeding the team's expectations. That, to me, is what separates Formula 1 games from everything else. Technically, the structure of practice, qualify, and race for position is bog standard, but in gaming, it's something only players in online leagues or the most dedicated of offline sim racers experience. Being made by people growing up with the Formula 1 games of old, Codemasters helped deliver that experience to more people with its accessibility options, slick presentation, and immersion on and off track. Unfortunately, the necessity of releasing it within the year it's named after meant that many elements are slightly lacking. For one thing, the AI isn't Codemaster's usual quality. There's far too many instances of crawling through certain corners, swapping lines, and defying the game's own physics. 
I'm not a purist when it comes to competition in games. I know that every AI system cheats on some level, and I encourage it. If inflating aspects of AI's behavior or rules makes the game better, why wouldn't you make it better? Moments like this, however, this is dumb and breaks the immersion. Because AI drivers defy physics and slow down at the most baffling moments, that the damage model isn't consistent or punishing is actually a blessing. The idea of simulation damage with AI like this is nightmare fuel. Managing temperatures and tires is nice, but quite one note. There's several instances of the engineer yelling about my engine being too hot only to become green seconds later. Tires have three modes, grippy, slippery, and very slippery, without a believable curve between them. And it's very poor UI design to have two car status menus where tires are green in one of them when they're orange in the other. In fact, the UI for all its sleek presentation can be obnoxious. Is this seriously meant to be a gearbox? And I had no idea what the hell this R&D menu even was until I unlocked parts, where it's revealed to just be a selection screen. But the worst aspect of 2010 is amazingly not the color palette. Okay, it is the color palette. I mean, seriously! What is the point of touring the world when Bahrain, Monte Carlo, and Montreal look the same? <sighs> the second worst thing is a distinct lack of polish. Textures phase in and out. The engineer repeats lines from a parallel universe. Penalties are a joke. We've just been told you've been given a drive through penalty for unsportsmanlike behavior. There's no start lights on screen, no slipstreaming, celebrations, podiums, safety cars, and red flags. My favorite mishap, however, is the automated pit lane that will not launch you if another driver's within a mile of you at its worst costing you 10 places or more. And the pit lane weirdly forces you to rev the nuts off the engine to maintain a basic speed. There's also a real lack of variety and flexibility. The career mode only lets you customize AI difficulty, assist, which themselves are limited, and length from 20% to full length. Aside from accomplishing R&D objectives for upgrades and moving to another team, there's nothing else going on. I said in that 2019 video the game's interviews were limited, but these make it look like Alpha Protocol. Not only are the questions more generic, they're repeated by the second race. And there's no other single player modes aside from Grand Prix and Time Trials. There's a lot of problems with F1 2010, and yet, I found myself getting invested in my Italian Red Bull journey. Because for all its missing features and mediocre components, it's got the core the foundation of a proper F1 experience. The presentation, driving model, and competition, despite the radically smaller team, manages to be almost as good as Codemasters' releases of that era, transferring many of their strengths into a new blueprint for potential to be iterated upon in the years to come. Or maybe not. F1 2011 isn't a mere roster update. Codemasters completely overhauled the physics from 2010, rebuilding the suspension entirely to portray the shifting weight of these machines, as well as to give more control to players. When the car began to slip previously, it was extremely difficult to catch, and would more than likely lead to a complete spin. That feeling of taming this beast that'll snap on you the instant you mistreat it is what gave 2010 an excitement that wasn't present in Dirt 2 nor Grid though it went a little far. Just because a driving game's more difficult, that doesn't mean it's more realistic. In real life, tires don't lose all grip the instant you're a millimeter over the edge. One of the biggest criticisms of iRacing in recent times stem from professional racing drivers explaining how the cars were too unforgiving. Actually, these cars are harder to drive, I hate to say that, than our cars. Our cars are pretty forgiving. When you get loose, they kind of catch themselves a little bit. This thing, when it gets loose, she gone and resulted in updates to let cars slide more freely. So Codemasters were right to address this in 2011, and I was genuinely shocked how much different this game felt. Though it goes a little far, just in the opposite direction. The cars in this game are easier to drive with no assists than last year's game with all of them. I've absolutely thrown these things with no consequence and in all the vehicles. It's far from being a top team exclusive. What's lost in just one game is tension while driving. 
making the game a lot more dull when you're stuck doing time trials until the checkered flag, where previously, taming that beast till the end made those races intense. You can lose the car if you push way too hard or barbecue the tires, but even then, it's so much more manageable. I've seen a lot of people describe this game's handling as floaty, and it fits. These feel much more like the Formula 3 in Grid than last year's game. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a downgrade overall. Firstly, the filter's gone. Old reviews demean the graphical fidelity, but I don't care. I'm just grateful for actual color, not just because it's easier on the eyes, but adds much needed variety to the different locations. There's a lot more detail overall. Bodywork reflects the environment, each cockpit's unique in both the steering wheel and their animations unlike last year, and engine sounds are much more distinct. Clearly I wasn't the only one making fun of the gearbox icon, because that's changed too. Pit stops no longer destroy your races nor deafen your ears, and the AI don't follow a set pass so overtly. The engineer's far less irritating, you're given a vital information screen while driving, and all of these absent features from last year's game are brought back in. There's also the introduction of KERS and DRS from The Real Sport, two methods of boosting your vehicle's performance for brief periods, though the game doesn't inform you of this beyond a single screen. Lacking explanations aside, everything's expanded and just better put together here. And despite the culture shock in driving, Grid and Dirt 3 are some of my favorite games of all time, so an F1 game of physics similar to those isn't a horrible prospect. Yeeting cars is fun. And while it's not as exciting when you're alone, hack racing is just as, if not more fun than before, due to being able to push these cars so much harder. For F1 fans, it's the only game where both Istanbul Park and Buda International Circuit are on the same calendar. Two of the best tracks to ever feature in the sport with a beautiful chain of corners that suits these formula cars like a glove. Considering this game raised the player cap from 12 to 16, added a beloved online co-op season mode, split screen, and everything else mentioned, it'd be dishonest to say this game's a net loss just because the physics are more forgiving. Besides, it's not the most arcadey. Not even close. Unbelievably, no game to this point had a tutorial. This finally changes with the Young Driver's Test, teaching everything quickly before Career Mode, which can also be cut or skipped entirely to play the two new modes, Champions and Season Challenge. The latter is a streamlined career mode where you move to new teams by selecting a rival and beating them in two out of three races on a 10-race calendar. The former consists of six challenges involving the six world champions that competed in this era, culminating to a race against all of them at the brand new venue, Circuit of the Americas, in Austin, Texas. Neither mode's particularly exciting for veterans due to their easy difficulty, but both combined with the young driver's test allow for players to build their way up to the career mode rather than participating in a trial by fire. And because of this training, the core gameplay doesn't have to be as forgiving as 2011. Braking's much more believable, requiring track knowledge once again to find the quickest lines, and vehicles can't be tossed around as harshly. It's still more 2011 than 2010, but it's in a better place than both, making those multi-lap pursuits more enjoyable. The missions are mostly symbolic. Like, oh yeah. Glock, what the fuck was that? The AI is not supreme. They still break too early, ignore gaps you've left wide open, and fall in line unrealistically. But on Legend difficulty, they are quick. And should you attempt it in midfield cars on basic setups, you're not going to catch even the most infamous of drivers. There's plenty of fun to be had battling, especially when managing the field with a friend. Really, the only issues I've got with 2012 are two baffling omissions. First, Grand Prix mode doesn't exist, only quick race. There's no ability to set exactly what and how many stages you want. I really can't imagine why. There's also the game's atmosphere. Codemaster's emphasis on the paddock might have only been skin deep, but 2012's replacement showroom, while emphasizing the game's gorgeous lighting and reflections, there is something unique to this day about seeing the press, presenters, and people milling around the trailers, where this comparatively is a little bit dull. 2013 makes even subtler adjustments, which is why I combined the two in this segment. With AI behavior and high-speed cornering receiving an upgrade, 
but by and large, it's the same game with two big expansions. Champions mode became scenario mode with 20 challenges rather than 7, and the introduction of classic cars. This would obviously return in later installments, but not only was this the first Codemasters game to feature them, it does the best job to this day of representing them. Optional filters can be used to emphasize the 80s and 90s appearance. The entire heads-up display is era-specific, not just the gauges. The legendary Murray Walker commentates in the extra scenarios built for this mode. Here we are at Jerez for another classic event, and we're in for an exciting race today with the 1988 Ferrari starting as favorites. And the best part, Codemasters released four classic circuits, Jerez, Brands Hatch, Estoril, and Imola. The game's completely flexible too. New cars can be played on these classic circuits and vice versa, on or offline, and in Grand Prix mode too. Of all these 7th Gen Formula 1 games, 2013 stacks up as a great game even to this day, deserving to stand right alongside Codemasters classics like Grid and Dirt 3 that you should purchase today. But you can't. At least not on PC. Yeah, just like Dirt 3, this game's the victim of licensing that's delisted it off of Steam. There might be codes laying around for people to hunt down, but there's certainly not going to be any Steam sales for this gem. Now, also just like Dirt 3, online works seamlessly, allowing friends who do own the game to still play. It's just unfortunate that you can't officially purchase the best game of this generation. But you can still buy 2012, so while it might have seemed obsolete at the time, now it's how you can experience old school F1 with new friends via Steam. It works seamlessly, runs great, and is still very fun to play. Dirt Showdown might have been a disappointment for that franchise, but 2012 isn't for Formula 1. It's polished, detailed, feature-rich, accessible, challenging, and aged remarkably well almost a decade after release. But it wasn't the only Formula 1 game released that year. At one of these years is when they released F1 Race Stars, which was developed out of that studio. And I loved that game. That game was awesome. No, not enough people played that game. That game was fucking bananas. Have you ever played it? I have now. It's easy to forget just how many arcade racers came out during this period. Codemasters' attempt to sell Formula 1 to the power-based kart racing sub-market is likely due to the absence of a Mario Kart game for HD systems. The seventh game was exclusive to the 3DS. But Formula 1's a much more difficult world to fantasize than Mario. To make a kart racer that's enjoyable while being true to Formula 1's spirit isn't an easy prospect. And I have to agree with Danny. Codemasters did a great job. And now that you know the circuits, it's going to be <laughs> insane because like, I think Monza might have been the demo and it's like all Italian shit, but like the parabolic is in it. You will know when you come to this crazy turn, like, oh, that's totally the parabolic. And like all of the circuits have one or two of the iconic turns in it. I, that's why I loved it. Cause like decoupling what these levels were actually doing was so much fun. Incorporating Formula One's distinct character goes far beyond distinct corners. Pit lanes exist as your car's capable of receiving damage, curves is one of your boost functions, and safety cars exist as a power-up, slowing down the rest of the field. One of the game modes involves managing your fuel and vehicle weight. It is bizarre to see drivers like Iceman Kimmy be depicted like this, but it's also quite charming. In fact, the game's whole style is. The animations are funny, the music during repairs is catchy, and the personality that's packed into each circuit is almost overwhelming. However, F1 Race Stars has one fatal flaw, and that's the driving itself. There's no drifting in this game, which isn't a problem, except for vehicles understeer more than the actual F1 games. It damages the sense of flow, which is critical to the enjoyment of arcade racers. I can respect the game's design being more about timing your powers correctly, but even Wipeout and its clones like Ballistic NG do a better job of that while maintaining a better sense of speed with sharper handling. In fairness, I wasn't experiencing this game in ideal conditions. Kart racers are best played with friends locally or online, which this game does support, even in tandem. <laughs> Officially. 
Unofficially, this game's online has been completely borked from day one on PC due to needing a connection to Codemaster's own service, Racenet Legacy. At least that was the theory. Thanks to one comment buried away on a Steam thread, I discovered why thousands are unable to play multiplayer, and the solution isn't linking old accounts. It's going to your open network and internet settings, selecting change adapter options, and disabling every single connection but the one you're using. It must also be a wired connection. Do that, and it works. No account linking required. And it's worth going through the minor inconveniences of this step because for all my complaints, this game has lots of depth that make it more than just a Mario clone, both in its complex circuits and power-ups. Every team has their own unique bonus trait, giving certain powers you pick up extra utilities. Holy shit! <laughs> Holy shit! The tracks themselves have hidden shortcuts and keys to unlock even better shortcuts. The blue tinted boost pads don't assure a quick exit like in most kart racers. You need to pump the accelerator three times while remaining in the pad to launch yourself with a maximum curs boost. While I still argue the handling's too understeery, I came to realize why Codemasters did it. If these things handled like burnout, you'd never miss a boost pad. Whereas with Raystars' handling, it's very possible to overshoot these turns and have no boost for the exit, resembling the sport. There's even bonuses the winner of a race can grant to other players, giving either a positive or negative trait for the next race. Admittedly, in single player, Race Stars isn't remarkable, but multiplayer? It comes alive. <laughs> but your sparks eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> the real crime is Codemasters never patching this game's connection issues, or at the very least, explaining the easy solution for resolving it. But if you've got the game and always wanted to play it with friends but couldn't, now you know how. And believe me, it's worth it. Hold that, it's good. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. No! Yeah! I was <laughs> uh, <laughs>that it's the worst Formula One release in Codemasters history, maybe even the flat-out worst driving game they've ever made. Yet I've never seen it. Back when it launched, all the big sites, which previously covered everything from 2010 to 2013, didn't post a video review of 2014. Not a single one. The Young Drivers Test has been abandoned completely in favor of an evaluation test. Now, admittedly the tutorial from earlier games was slightly drab, but it could be skipped for all modes but the full career mode and genuinely teaches you about all of Formula 1's unique traits. This evaluation test doesn't teach anything. There's nothing in regards to stopping distances, tire management, wet weather conditions, DRS, etc. You just drive a lap of Monza and then based on your performance, it assigns a difficulty, which for me, didn't even seem to work as I was cruising past everybody at the recommended level. In content, F1 2014's an immediate step backward with no classic cars from last year. Thankfully, all the core modes, career, season challenge, scenario, and co-op are retained, if not improved in any capacity. On a smaller note, the UI manages to be a total copy of 2013 while being worse due to its hideous and confusing usage of Bahrain in the day when the actual Bahrain in-game looks of a higher quality and takes place at night. I can only expect they originally planned to park your car at every circuit but ran out of time. Time that was solely devoted to replicating for players an all-new era of Formula One, the first generation of hybrids. Despite using V6 engines the size of your average hatchback at 1.6 liters, they're turbocharged and combined with an electric motor, making them more powerful than the previous generation of V8s, specifically in torque. These cars were a handful, even for real-life racers. I really didn't like those cars because 14, you know, we came from 13 with the blown diffuser cars, you know, quite a lot of downforce. Um, and then 14, yeah, it was kind of a castrated Formula 1 car for me. And it doesn't didn't really suit my driving style. I couldn't, you know, drive yeah, but it hard. Why was it? Uh, did you bigger. enjoy the extra torque though from the? Not the really, hand. because you couldn't use it. You didn't have the grip and the downforce to use it. So you had to really underdrive and be super sensitive. So, 
You're a developer trying to make a game more accessible to newcomers, and the sport you're replicating builds cars that are less pleasant to the ears, eyes, and foot. That's a tall order, especially with the smallest development team yet by 100 people, for systems that were replaced over a year ago. The circumstances this game was built under were dire to say the least. And yet... This feels fucking horrible. It manages to disappoint. The front tires are F1 race stars. They never slip, no matter the angle, speed, or conditions, and are seriously prone to understeer. The rear tires generate wheel spin and can make the car slide, but never at an angle that's impossible to hold, essentially acting as the drift button. Even with the lowest downforce, the slipperiest tires, no assists, and the most careless of driving, I could not get my double dick nose burning Grosjean Lotus Renault to overpower me. And speaking of overpowered, there's the brakes. I think it's supposed to do that last one. That's bullshit! Bullshit! Oh, no, no, that's what? No, I'm not saying the game's unrealistic. I'm saying the game feels like shit. And it sounds even worse. I know going from V8s to vacuum cleaner V6s is part of it, but later games would disprove that these engines can't sound good. It's how low quality the sound is, how obnoxious the hybrid whine is that make this game painful to listen to. And the graphics, while not bad, are a step backward from its predecessors, specifically lacking the effects such as glare from another driver's mirrors. It was a disappointing qualifying for Ferrari yet. What's that drop in? Yeah, that was... <laughs> What's that? The hand of God has placed me here at Singapore. The fucking Sims physics dropping you in. <laughs> I've been curious about this game for years, and I can confidently say, even with my limited playtime, it is the worst Codemasters racing game I've played, which is nearly all of them. Look, I'm not the biggest fan of Dirt Showdown. It's limited in content, obnoxious in tone, and many of its unique qualities would be surpassed by games like Wreckfest. But it's a solid game. It looks good, sounds better, and feels good in your hands. This has nothing going for it and I mean nothing. One of the features of 2015, it has the 2014 season. The only meaningful innovation made is in the career mode. For the first time in the franchise, you're able to start on any team. This would become critical to future games in the series, and it was started here. But due to the career mode being otherwise identical to previous games, this innovation wouldn't have a chance to shine until two years later. Formula One 2014 can be summarized with this. <laughs> the most helpful reviews. The first review, bring 2013 back, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Formula 1 2015 is considered to be the other bad game of the franchise, and the reasons why are noted is from the instant you boot it up. The main menu features Championship Season, Championship Season with no assists, Quick Race, Online, Time Trials, that's it. All of these? Gone. And it's for the reasons this happens at least once in every sports franchise. F1 2015 is the first foray into the next generation of consoles where Codemasters essentially rebuilt everything from the ground up. There's not one trace of the 7th generation F1 games in any department. No repeated animations, force feedback, UI prompts, camera angles, character models, road textures, track videos, audio cues, nothing. It's all new, yet all familiar to me. Because 2015 would serve as the foundation for all future installments. It's fascinating to see the same starting screens, multiplayer lobbies, retirement animations, and yes, handling characteristics. Which means 2015 feels good, like really good. Vehicles turn in when they instinctively should, keeping the rear at bay in these tail-happy cars is an engaging challenge with an appropriate curve and grip, unlike some. The AI is much better. They're aggressive, but in a generally fair manner, and so much more believable than even the best of the seventh generation, mainly due to how much they battle each other, rather than just forming a great big caterpillar. The cars themselves are so much more pronounced this year as well. There were subtle differences in previous games, but I never had to tweak my driving style per vehicle. All that really changed was overall pace, and even then, the way previous games portrayed a sense of speed made everything past 170 feel pretty much the same. Now, 
driving a McLaren Honda is noticeable immediately. Well, Jeep V2 engine already. <laughs> yeah. More importantly, the handling model's detailed enough to now make these cars feel different to drive. The Red Bull feels so good in the corners, but then you get to a straight and wish you had the Williams or Ferrari. The Force Indy is a handful, but really good fun for those who prefer a slipperier car. The Toro Rosso is better for those who prefer the opposite. The games also made a massive improvement graphically, ugly character models aside. The lighting effects, sense of speed, unique details of each team, it's all very impressive, especially in wet weather conditions. At long last, getting caught in the spray doesn't apply that awful blur effect that's been the low point of otherwise beautiful games. There's many other quality of life improvements as well, such as being able to finally tweak your camera settings precisely. Now, I wouldn't call this game great, and not just because of its limited feature set. Force feedback's the worst it's ever been, which is strange considering the old games, while hardly refined, actually aren't bad even on a direct drive setup. Engine notes are rather quiet in the mix, making it hard to time shifts based on audio cues, and despite all the patches, this game is the buggiest in the franchise by a country mile. One multiplayer session with two friends exposed a year's worth of incompetence. Though, many of them, such as the driver's nationality changing after you've driven their vehicles, is admittedly hilarious. We're slowly conquering the world to the point where the only people that exist are Canadian, Ukrainian, and Jamaican. <laughs> okay, like a, okay. It's like a uh, late stage game of Civ. <laughs> <laughs> but that there's no option in multiplayer to disable ghosting is quite telling of how confident Codemasters were of this game's stability. It makes complete sense why 2015 was lambasted so much at launch, but unlike this franchise's worst entry, the potential is obvious. Codemasters built a solid blueprint with this game to be expanded upon and addressed for years to come. It was a terrible value proposition at the time of its release, and lacking not just features and modes, but features in gameplay like the safety car or even the virtual safety car introduced that year in the real sport. But in retrospect, this game's actually aged much better than I expected, and it's hardly the weakest entry. Though after witnessing the weirdest and the worst, it's time for some quality. I remember seeing Formula One 2016 release and think, a career mode. That's your selling point? That thing you drop because a yearly release schedule clashed with the trials and tribulations of modern game development. Pathetic. Thankfully, I've grown since then. Because while Formula One 2016 is barren on the surface, it is one of the best games to be released in the sport's long history. In fact, there's things it does better than the game which got me into this mess. And all of those things are found within the new career mode. The name itself might be the same as F1's V8 era games, but the depth, immersion, and flexibility of this mode is leaps and bounds over them. For one thing, 2014's innovation of starting with any team realizes its potential here. One of the key components that makes modern F1 games more car PG than your usual simcade is selecting your role. Maintaining the Mercedes crown is just as compelling to some people as pushing McLaren's pitifully underpowered Junior League engine into the points, and that becomes even more possible with dedicated research and development pages. R&D existed in prior games, but it was never developed further than 2010 where you complete a single challenge during a practice session to net a potential upgrade. There was no decision making, no long term dedication, and not a whole lot of reinforced motivation beyond subtly quicker lap times. Right from the off in 2016, you're assigning a limited number of assets towards specific upgrades. Assets that are earned through your consistent ability in game with designated practice tests and varying goals during those sessions. What's brilliant is Codemasters also expanded upon teammate competition. R&D's more varied, plentiful, dedicated, and affected in dozens of ways by your teammate. You don't want to give one category to them, one point on the board against you. And this leads to one aspect that's better than the most recent games, the off-track immersion. Rather than being permanently affixed to your team's headquarters, your laptop's set to each of the individual circuits. It helps make you feel like you're traveling the world, completing weekends of sessions rather than working an office job. Obviously, the building assets are reused, but that's accurate to the sport. These paddocks are meant to be efficient to put up and tear down again. 
And in that repetition is variety in the seating locations, NPC models, conversations, people exiting and milling around the paddock. There's even animations in the pit box of team members handing you tablets for setups. There's just an awesome vibe in this game, and vibe is something that's been sorely missed in the racing genre. Why do people still use Gran Turismo's menu music? Because it immediately puts you in that world rather than just any other circuit racer. And speaking of music, the score's a big part of 2016's vibe. I mean, this is what skipping time sounds like in 2019. And this is what it sounds like in 2016. I think they changed it because players wouldn't stop. I know I didn't. The presentation is just improved across the board. For a five-year-old game, its vehicle models and lighting are superb. And while the commentary is a little stiff due to its scripted nature, the dynamic of David Croft and Anthony Davidson is good at not just spicing up the previously solo commentary, but giving information about the sport this game's depicting. You raced here, of course, didn't you, back in your Super Aguri days in that infamous Chinese Grand Prix of 2007? Yeah, that's right. I didn't last that long, though, unfortunately. Uh, qualifying had gone pretty well, but the brakes failed quite early in the race, around lap 10 or 11, something like that. And of course, back in 2004, I was the very first Formula 1 driver to complete a lap of this circuit. Just thought I'd mention that for you, Crofty, like a good stat. All of this is supported with the best overall gameplay the series had, and is still really enjoyable. Nico Hulkenberg might have disliked these cars in real life, but at least in this game, I find the limited grip on these skinny tires being paired with such epic levels of torque to be an engaging conundrum. Do you accept your fate and understeer wide, or gently kick the back end out with your right foot? risking an entire spin, or at the very least, scrubbing off speed and usable rubber. You feel confident enough to make daring moves, but not so confident that going 150 miles an hour around a bend is completely boring. And while 2015 might have established this game's foundation right down to having the same intro animations, there's a lot of refinements. Now, camera settings can be assigned to each individual driver perspective. Setups can be downloaded via the Steam Workshop. Manual starts give tension to even the lights. Tutorial videos are always accessible. Engines are more audible, the AI is less violent, and the multifunction display, or MFD, makes its debut, letting you easily adjust fuel modes, pitch strategies, and car damage from one menu combined with voice control. But most importantly, unlike 2015, it feels polished. All of these games have bugs, but in 2015, you can't escape them. They pop up in the lobbies, even though replays generating busted spark effects. Really, the biggest criticism I could give 2016 is that it is repetitive. Objectives during practice sessions vary, but the activities on track don't. Making the absence of a refined season challenge mode slightly disappointing as this game's career mode does allow 5 lap races and one shot qualifying, but doesn't mesh with the dedication required for collecting R&D credits. And for as much as I like the efforts for player immersion in the garage and paddock, I understand why Codemasters abandon these things, as they do get in the way of the setup page, and many players will stop caring about these animations after hundreds of hours have been clocked. Though I still think they should have kept the backdrops. Because Formula 1 is about immersing the player, not just in a car, but a world. And 2016 achieves this splendidly. 2017's biggest change has nothing to do with Codemasters, but the cars themselves. Welcome to the second generation of hybrid-powered cars, the initial year of what we're currently witnessing the final year of before third generation. They're bigger, thicker, and quicker than just about any previous era of Formula cars. Unfortunately, they still sound like vacuum cleaners in this game. But in terms of gameplay, it's remarkable just how different they are to drive. The increase in rubber and downforce plants them to the tarmac like nothing Codemasters had ever depicted at the time. I became used to these designs via 2019, but coming from the earlier games, it really is a culture shock. These feel more like the anti-gravity races previous F1 developer Studio Liverpool made. Which frankly is worrying. Because the last time new regulations were replicated, things didn't turn out very well. 
Thankfully, F1 2017 is rock solid with its excellent handling and proved feedback in two important editions. Career mode looks a lot more familiar to late series adopters like myself thanks to the all new R&D skill tree featuring 100 upgrades. 2016 had multiple categories for players to invest, but nothing to this extent. Its main benefits are more notable changes to your cars, creating more positive reinforcement for players and more decisions to make even within one category like aerodynamics. Upgrades can even fail development, and there are bonuses you can acquire to make those occur less often, though it'll cost you. All the immersive qualities from 2016 remain with the animations, paddock, garage, and now your team's data center. You're also now restricted to four engines and gearboxes throughout the season, risking a penalty should you develop a new one. It's a subtle but brilliant change that's in keeping with the real sport, where drivers actually do need to manage or sacrifice parts during a race, and it's fascinating to debate while driving at 200 miles an hour. Finally, the career mode has some much-needed variety added through invitational events to drive classic cars from previous generations of F1 including the 90s, 2000s, and even the 2010 Red Bull, making it quite the throwback for the franchise itself. Though I must say, while F1 2017 is very good, there's something about it that's rather… cold. The vibe from 2016 has been swapped for something that feels a lot more basic. The infectious beats and visual collage have been swapped for ambience and in-game screenshots that just don't stir anything in me which would be okay if the game felt more refined, but it doesn't. This game isn't 2014. It doesn't stagnate everything for a poor translation of new cars. In fact, it expands on the previous game. And perhaps that explains the inconsistent lighting, lower frame rate and celebrations, glitched menus, and murderous AI. Okay. And it's fuck you, whoever that is. Palmer. 2001, only 312. What the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> it's hard to pinpoint, but there's just something about this game that doesn't feel as beautifully put together as last time. And unlike 2016, many of 2017's gameplay and features have been done better in the past and future. Welcome to my most played game of not just the series, but the last two years. Because I started with F1 2019, the rest of the games I've covered are more first impressions today rather than a trip down memory lane. I know there's plenty of specific bugs, unique characteristics, and details to the sport and or game that I missed along the way. But F1 2020 will not be my first impressions. It'll be an unavoidably personal account, and to explain why, I've got a shell. The Shambles Championship is a league started by friends L. Hudson, Ham I Am, and myself, with the former producing high quality replays, highlights for YouTube, and weekly streams on Twitch. This is what those multiplayer sessions in F1 2019 with them became. In short, at 10 people and 5 teams, we aim to be professional in all regards, except an attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Full-length races, realistic performance cars, expert AI, and both a driver's and constructor's battle with moments like this. Oh, no, no, no! And it's in this environment of intensity and idiocy where Formula One 2020 on multiple occasions has become completely and utterly broken. On my screen, Patty, your fucking wing blew up without you doing anything. It, like, nothing happened to you, your wing just exploded. <laughs> That's how fast Ham was going. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're playing with people from all over the globe. Maybe it's because there's new circuits the AI aren't properly programmed for. Maybe it's because the netcode issues rather than the game systems. Maybe it's because I played this game for 200 hours rather than 8. But... Good grief, some of the things I've seen in this game just boggles the mind. Hey. 
Oh my fucking god, the AI is just on lockdown. Uh oh. Uh oh. Watch out, watch out. Oh shit, yeah. Watch watch out. They just completely fucking need for speed roadblock that bitch. <laughs> just more footage speed. for me to use in the video. Let's go. <laughs> stroll past me. Stroll Wait, stroll past me. Get stroll past me. Stroll past me. <laughs> like hit <gasps> Oh no. Uh oh, there goes another one. <laughs> It's a line. Um, and that's... And another oh, one. That's... And another one. I was looking at my rear view mirrors and Ray's driver was T-boating. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? There's the floating wheel. They walked away. My fucking pit crew walked away. They... What the fuck? And he is now in podium position. Whoa, what the fuck? My game just... If bitching was a fuel source, the 10 of us could launch the next space shuttle. And likely what spawns a frustration is that outside of these bugs, 2020 is the franchise's absolute zenith. With F1 2019 being beaten down by the sport's real drivers during the COVID pandemic, Codemasters took direct feedback from them and addressed many quirks in the handling model, but not in the way many would assume. One of the drivers told Codemasters the cars felt more natural with the traction control turned on, even though the drivers in real life have no assists, because inadvertently, the assist in-game more resembled the amount of grip real drivers were used to. Many of the changes in 20's handling weren't to make the game more difficult, but more natural. The same thing was done with ERS management. In the last two games, real drivers often stuck with the automatic function, as again, this is more akin to what they actually do. They're not flipping between ERS 1 and 4 constantly. It's on auto with an overtake mode that boosts the power for a brief period. No longer needing to correct oversteer and top gear and having a boost button may seem like really minor changes, but it only takes one race to see all of Codemaster's developments in wheel inertia, weight calculations, braking maps, the absolute nerdiest shit made a big difference. The downforce these cars generate is twice their own weight, and finally, that force pressing the car down is felt through every corner. No longer do you need the dedicated aero machine that is the Red Bull to stamp on the accelerator at high speed with total confidence the car's going to hold. The grip, as the jump to these second generation cars did from earlier games, lets you attack the same sectors you've done in all new ways. Most importantly, having that confidence pushes you into those epic battles against other racers, concentrating more on how to beat them, rather than when the car's going to suddenly let go in 8th gear. Having the overtake button is such a good change as well. No longer is there having to fiddle with the meter or setting it to automatic and having no extra power while hunting someone down. Now it's on command, and unlike the curse system, there's consequences for abusing it as that limited boost charge is connected to the battery itself. No longer are you guaranteed a refill upon crossing the start line. It's because of these changes that the unique cars are more pronounced than ever. Driving the racing point for a full season has been a completely different experience of the AlphaTauri in how they handle, the former being a slingshot, the latter being a housefly. But the extraordinary thing is, unlike 11 or 14, the grippier handling doesn't come at the cost of tension. Just because you've got more grip, it doesn't mean the game is easy. You're still on the verge of losing it should you get on the power too early, flick the wheel, or bump someone at the wrong time. It's not easier. It's more natural. And if you're not ready for the natural order, don't use it. 20 added a new casual mode with extra parameters to ease in new players, making the reintroduction of split screen more appealing. But 20's biggest addition is its all new mode, My Team. It's exactly what it sounds. You start Formula 1's 11th team on the contemporary grid as an owner-driver, taking care of business on and off track. You've got to manage everything from before along with salaries, drivers, facilities, power units, sponsorships, everything short of what energy drinks use to shorten the lifespan of your employees. Beginning with a dog's breakfast of a vehicle is a little tedious, but punching above your weight is really good fun as is steadily developing your car at a higher rate than the competition if you're effective. My team's a mode that just gets more fascinating the more time you spend in it. I've not played nearly as much as I want to due to spending so much time in multiplayer with friends, 
but the careers I've seen are insane. Especially as the driver changes introduced in 2019 very much include your own. Your teammate can abandon you even after a whole season of helping them develop as a driver. Now, I can't help but want more from this mode in terms of immersion. The dull liveries and fake sponsors isn't dated when compared to Need for Speed or Forza. It's dated when compared to NASCAR Thunder 2004. There's mods online where people have made some pretty awesome designs, but that should be possible within the game itself rather than Photoshop. It's the same with things like steering wheels, engine notes, and facilities. Just a few hints of personalization in these areas to really make this mode immersive and impassioned could go a long way. But this is a first attempt, and as such, it's brilliant. And even if you don't like it, the normal career mode still exists. Nothing's been lost in 20's features, gameplay, and presentation. Only gained. Really nitpicking, the soundtrack's not as good as 19. I really wish I could disable specific rules in multiplayer like blue flags, and occasionally it crashes. This will annoy the friends of mine who've been the victim of its deadliest bugs over the course of two seasons of shambles, but that's partly why we called the league what it is. For all its faults, F1 2020 is the good one, the best one, the one with nearly everything you could ask for from a Formula One game, something that pleases Formula One fans and has spawned all new ones. But what about that new one with an EA logo on the box? Finally, we're here, the end. The end of Codemasters' independence, and the end of Formula One's second generation of hybrid-powered cars. But it still features an all-new mode for the franchise, Breaking Point, aka Story Mode. Yes, it's all the rage these days in sports video games to add those cinematic black bars and tell a tale within the world you're licensing. From Fight Night to NBA, FIFA, Madden, and now Formula One. Though it's anything but Codemasters' first stab at it. Such a thing was prominently advertised on television in Pro Race Driver in 2002. In fact, that era hosted all sorts of attempts to integrate storytelling into racing games, with lots of them being great in spite of the story rather than because of them. Breaking Point is no different. Starring rookie Aiden Jackson and veteran Casper Ackerman, you complete a series of challenges taking place from the end of Jackson's 2019 Formula 2 career to a rewritten version of the 2021 Formula 1 season, where COVID never happened and Haas are still a midfield team. Challenges include completing a wet race, recovering from a puncture, and nursing the car home with a broken gearbox. The game adapts to your team selection where Aiden Jackson wants to go in the future and adjusts emails to your placements and post-race interviews, and that's it. You're not going to find any meaningful dialogue options, branching story paths, or variable scenarios, which, honestly, I wasn't expecting any of but I did expect at least some memorable moments and quality presentation that Codemasters have demonstrated on numerous occasions, most notably Grid 2. But no, Breaking Point's not only a poor outing compared to other racing stories, it's poor when compared to other racing video game stories. Firstly, the scenarios are total snore. Those three examples I gave do not entail what most of the campaign is, that being effectively time trials via objectives you'll complete four laps ahead of schedule to a conclusion that's just the same music, animations, and celebrations we've been seeing since 2018. With only commentary to give additional context, where we're supposed to believe Crofty would talk about a midfield team's performance the instant Lewis Hamilton scores another victory, while simultaneously never acknowledging that midfield team beating their big brother for a victory. What a race for Kasper Ackerman! Proving the naysayers wrong with an emphatic performance. He'll be delighted by that podium finish. Bitch, I won the race in front of my driver's home crowd in a slower car. Lots of the story isn't even told through cutscenes, but text boxes and phone calls where if the voice filter's added or not is a roll of the dice. But amazingly, despite the lack of presentation and the lack of polish in what little is presented, the most lacking aspect is character. I could put up with the boring races, lack of presentation, and minimal reactivity if the characters weren't so forgettable. I think it's telling the character everyone notes in this game is the antagonist from two years ago. 
because as far as storytelling goes, being a dickhead is this game's height of personality. The main character's motivations and grievances are downright pathetic, especially when we're supposed to believe one of them's been in the sport as long as the real-life veteran Kimi Raikkonen. It's more like a hobby for me, so obviously I don't need to do it if I don't want. Pro Race Driver's story was bad, but I still remember Ryan McCain, his brother Donnie, as well as engineers Bobby and Pauly. Our Racing Evolution story was bad, but I remember the scenarios, Rena's team orders, and Gina's plot. Breaking point I have no memory, memory of. I empathize greatly with the challenges a studio with so little storytelling experience has in working within a licensed property. For one thing, your story needs to be E for everyone, so no cursing, fixing, gambling, narcotics, rule breaking, or indeed any misgivings other than the mistake of social media. For another, you've got to use official brands, drivers, and commentators who don't want any risks don't have time to give new material on demand, and who aren't professional voice actors that'll give convincing performances. But you do have the freedom to make any scenarios you want. Crashing out a rival on purpose, engine blowing up during a good run, pit stop failure, nursing a puncture with the next competitor in hot pursuit, flipping the bird while battling, a four lap showdown, driving with the flag, top three wrecking out opening up the podiums for everyone else, and yet the game doesn't facilitate one notable scenario within its scenario mode. There's lots of things to criticize Drive to Survive for, but its first episode is great. Introducing Haas, the plucky underdog with a quarter of Ferrari's budget and staff, fighting their way to the top five when disaster strikes in the pit lane. Their first driver to leave, Magnussen, exits with a misaligned wheel, ending his awesome race. You feel empathy for the team you've taken a liking to, only for viewers' hearts to sink almost immediately after when his teammate Grosjean suffers the exact same fate. You've witnessed the sport's highs and lows firsthand, and why it's so compelling. That one moment is more dramatic than the entirety of Breaking Point's narrative. I understand the novelty of seeing cutscenes in a Formula One game, but if this is the caliber of narrative we're getting in Grid Legends, I'm worried. Playing the occasional cutscene as a reward for completing a mind-numbing series of linear goals is what I'd expect from Patchy Slot, not a licensed product of the world's premier motorsport. That driving games have failed to nail down a proper narrative isn't a warning of its impossibility, but every developer's storytelling inexperience and inevitable incompetence, and the consumer's lack of insistence on innovation to the point where just having a story mode in an F1 game is worth putting on a pedestal. I don't want Breaking Point to come back until it's been made a lot better than this. It needs to be better than this. For as much as I hated Need for Speed Carbon Own the City's plot, I'd happily take its dumbfounding conclusion over the video game equivalent of eating flour. So Breaking Point sucks, but the rest of the game? Arguably the best of the franchise in gameplay. The classic cars don't return, but Career and my team do, plus the significant return of Co-op Career with a competition variant where two players can sign their contracts independently, and developing their team's car in private adds an extra layer of mind games to the proceedings of R&D, contracts, and parts management. It's a really awesome addition to the game that's been sorely missed since 2014, and made even better than it was being a first step towards what the Shambles founders and I have been dreaming for years, a multiplayer career mode, where we can no longer abuse our engines with the safety of the next session starting in a new lobby. Gameplay-wise, the handling's been tweaked even further, both in accordance with regulation changes in this year's Formula One season and a feedback from players and drivers. Curbs are deadly this year thanks to an overhaul of how downforce works in-game, adding even more tension to races as you can no longer be my friend Hudson using the car like a pizza cutter. That's good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's... All right, that's good. Okay, okay. All right, okay, all right. Okay, that's good. That's good. It's... It's enough slices! The AI is also way more aggressive, which considering the issues in 2020 is concerning, but so far, so good. There's the ever-present conga line sometimes letting you gain eight places by being sneaky or a dick. But the former's happened in real life, and the latter doesn't seem to be as reliable as it was, 
due to the AI in more realistic fashion not always moving aside like the player's going to kick their wing off. When racing other people, it's a common courtesy not to dive bomb, shove them off track, or close the door. But the AI in racing games are often meant to avoid the player at all costs as to not destroy their race and potentially their patience with the game. But it leads to players developing a lot of bad habits that they can then take with them online. Making the AI hold their lines, find gaps, and push you into backing off is, ironically, a good step in encouraging better habits from players. Making the racing more consistent, intense, and enjoyable. But 21's adjustments are more for fans like me to get fixated over. Truthfully, breaking point's the only draw for newcomers, and not a very good one. Which is why, though my opinion may change with time, 20 is, I think, the best overall game this series has produced. Truth be told, nearly all of these games are good. Not all, but considering we've covered 14 games in a yearly sports franchise, where it's ended up after it started is staggering. These are the best F4 games that have ever existed. And one of the first video games I ever played was Jeff Kramen on the Amiga. I have the rose tinted glasses for, the, for those old games too, but these games appeal to so many different types of people in so many different ways, and they've been consistent in a way that no other F1, Jeff Kramen and all, no other video game series around F1 racing has been. It's been a decade and they've been doing a great job. So like, could they be better? Sure. Could there be more people watching F1 and a bigger market and then you could stick a bigger dev team on it? Yeah, sure. So hopefully that's the case. Hopefully stuff like Drive to Survive and the new regs coming in, this fantastic season that we're enjoying at the moment, more races in America to open up that market. I think F1, when they started the Codemasters game, there was this whole shakiness about the F1 audience that I don't feel is there anymore. Hopefully it's growing and hopefully they get, you know, even more resources. Not one of these games has had the development team of Dirt 2 from 12 years ago. Codemasters Birmingham were given the hefty task of carrying on a brand that's not only important to the real world, but the gaming world too through its legacy of games like Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix in EA's Career Challenge. And yet, they have produced some of the best games in the franchise. And for those who've already typed their comments about the physics being more realistic in games like Assetto Corsa and R Factor, I hear you. I love those games too. The former is especially like all I played for a few weeks this year. Modding in an absurd number of tracks with the premium cars you can even see in F1's own videos. But let's be realistic. Which game captures the atmosphere of Formula One better? The game with a handful of F1 cars out of the box, less of the tracks, and even through amazing mods like Race M Studio is a spec series, or F1 2020, with all the cars, tracks, commentators, spectators, role-playing, and pit crews. Which game allows newcomers to conveniently settle in with a wide variety of modes, assists, difficulty levels, and easy-to-use menus? Which one lets you set up lobbies with a friend instantly? Games cannot be boiled down to physics. At least they shouldn't be, except for the most dedicated sim racers and real-world drivers, who are the fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And even then, they're still games. And don't come close to simulators you'd find at BMW and Red Bull, costing upwards of one million dollars. I'd love it if the game appealed to more real-world drivers. I'd love it if it had VR support. I'd love it if I could turn off blue flags. I'd love a truly simulated weather system. I'd love all the bugs to be fixed. But what currently exists is a game that's given me hundreds of hours of not just entertainment, but the most fun I've had gaming in years. And it wouldn't have happened if Codemasters didn't continuously push themselves, never becoming complacent with even their highest rated games in over a decade of producing them. But will that continue? Looking at EA's output in particular, it is concerning. I'm less worried about Codemasters themselves replicating a new generation of formula cars as F1 2017 was solid, Though I won't be surprised if Formula 2, Breaking Point, or Co-op gets dropped. I am of the mind that only time will tell, but out of curiosity, I asked Danny what he thought. I would not be surprised if they start some way of getting more money out of that audience. But what that is, I don't know. I, 
will it be microtransactions? I don't think so necessarily because to do that you really need quite a large player base because it doesn't appeal to most people quite frankly you know what I mean there's just not enough F1 teams or drivers to do like a ultimate team type thing like even F1 cards I have a couple of them here packs of them they don't sell right to me I think the way that they would maybe do it is by having aggressive or maybe not DLC strategy where they add in classic cars or add in classic drivers or add in classic tracks or or add in different race series or something like that it makes sense just because that's what other sims do and what's I'd funny buy them. yeah like I, people <laughs> cry dlc if they came out with 20 quid and i could ride a drive turkey and you know <laughs> fucking go-karts sure that model, that DLC model, compared to something like an iRacing that you need to pay monthly for and $15 per car and track, and if you ever stop the subscription, you have access to none of that content you purchased. <laughs> something like I said, of course, a competition that has a $20 DLC pack with all the GT4 cars, people love that shit, and they flock yeah. to it, and they buy it in droves. But it always feels different, right? It feels different when it's like a bunch of passionate, independent developers, and then it's EA, you know what I mean? It's if there was an EA Sports logo to set a course, <laughs> there'd be a lot more hesitation, I imagine, yeah. Exactly, but I but I do think there is, you know, if you've ever gone to an F1 race, you know how expensive <laughs> the sport is, so I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll, they have, you know, the, the fucking graph on the whiteboard has dollar signs on it or whatever, but, you know, but we'll see. In the event that the F1 games drive themselves off a cliff via EA's demands, I'd be okay with the F1 games we have. What making this video showed me is that driving games don't age like they used to. 2012 co-op is still fun, 2016's career is still engaging, and Race Stars is still deserving of online support. The best games in this list are, despite being yearly sports titles, almost timeless. Regardless of what the next era has in store, the one that's ended is one I can always revisit. By coincidence, the Shambles Championship finale is happening now, 1.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to be exact. If you miss the show or don't have time to stick around, links are in the description to the Shambles Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch page. Special thanks to Stufer for his graphics as always, and to Danny O'Dwyer for both the G29 wheel over a year ago he sent when the idea for this project started, and for his time to talk. How can Bobby Kotek and J. Allen Brack stand up despite having no spine? You don't need a spine if you're not human. Who would you punch a Red Bull can-sized hole in the skull to? Bobby Kotek. Did you hear about the Titanfall Apex hack? Yep. After this video, are you going to do more classic games, i.e. from the PS2, 360, or before that? Funnily enough, So I Finally Played was meant to be a retro series that became a late review series by accident. But now that I've done both, it's back to being whatever the hell I want, so yes, I absolutely want to cover earlier games that have been released. Revisiting Nightfire was a lot of fun, and I'd love to do it again, both for games I love and games I hate. You're running a server dedicated and focused on yourself, your creations, and your achievements. Doesn't that make you a narcissist? Sure, but all anybody does is post rat trains, so it balances out. Why do you have six hours into the titty fighter known as DOA-6? Because DOA-6 is an awesome fighter. I'd probably put the same hours I did into Soul Calibur 6 if more of my friends had it. Though I don't blame them for not having it, as the game's rarely on sale for a reasonable price and the DLC is disgusting to even look at. It's quite hilarious to look back at all the controversy surrounding this game from the threat of its TNA being reduced. It wasn't. It was just put behind unlocks and DLC that weirdos who don't understand Google's the world's memory provider are clearly spending money on. But yeah, UA6 is really fun. Why do you hate Jeff so much? Do you really need to ask? Shut up, Jeff! <laughs> Which Hot Wheel is best Hot Wheel? You'll find out. World at War years later when? and could you let us all know so we can help with multiplayer footage? The debate for me is whether to do World at War this year or Modern Warfare 2. I'll decide at some point, and shall reach out for multiplayer assistance 
sometime soon. Alpha Max Nova 1 collab when? If he watches shambles, I guess. But let the man go at his own pace. The content's better for it. Hugs and kisses.